My, my, my. We heard a message preached this morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I can feel that way right now. And that was preached this morning here at FPC. There was a powerful move of the Holy Ghost over at TDV. It's filling up the house over there on Gear Street. It's filling up the house here at Carver Street. I told Brother Glenda, we need about $5 million. We'll get there. But isn't God good? God is so good. <clears throat> Amen. Good to have Nate and Amanda Parker here with us tonight from Canada. God bless you all. Brother and Sister Parker's family. And Zach and Logan are here again. And their son, they've been here. Amen. I'm so glad about it. Others of you that are here, good to have Jim Coleman from Mississippi. Where's Jim at? Right back here. God bless you. Welcome to First Pentecostal Church. We're glad that you could come to worship the Lord with us. And others of you, we're so glad you came. Woo! Just join in. You don't have to wait on an invitation. You don't have to wait on some signal. Man, this is foot stomping, hand clapping, Jesus' name outpouring at its finest. Hallelujah. He's still a deliverer. He's still a way maker. He's still a provider. He's still a savior. Hey! Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. There has been such a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And this has been a sobering, somber week. A hurricane hit. South Florida devastated Fort Myers, the Lee County area, and that has caught national attention. It has particularly caught my attention. That was my hometown for 15 years. Planted a church there, wonderful church. We love them, and if they're watching tonight, we support you. Durham stands with you. And over the course of the next seven days to the tonight, Tuesday night, and next Sunday, we're going to just take up a special offering for them to send down there for relief. There are people whose homes are devastated. The church, the, the roof was torn off the church. Many people had standing water in their homes. So we're just going to, if, you, if you're able just to put in something extra for Fort Myers, we're going to send that offering off to them, and we're going to be a blessing to them. Amen. It's in times like that where you, you realize that you need a church family that can bind together. Amen. 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 Let's stand. Let's open up the word of the Lord. God has been talking to my heart this week, and I'm so thankful for the presence of the Lord that I feel right now. <clears throat> Let's open the Bible to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Amen. And we're going to look at what the writer of Hebrews said. I'm looking around this sanctuary while, while you turn there, and I'm seeing testimonies all over this, all over this place. I see people that a short while ago, they, they weren't where they are in God, but God's brought you from a long way. Amen. God made it fail. I'm looking up in the balcony at people that have faced circumstances and adversity and the devil came against them, but God made it fail. I walked into the Sunday school this morning and I saw teachers teaching students and those teachers are determined that God's going to make it fail. He's going to plant good things in the hearts of young people and children. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm going to read verse 22, one portion of Scripture. This caught my attention this morning. I, I was so enraptured this morning over a hot cup of coffee. The enrapturing was done by the Holy Ghost. The comfort came from the coffee. 
But before the sun rose, God began to talk to my heart. Verse 22, Hebrews 11, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Gave commandment concerning his bones. My title might puzzle you at first. I hope I can get my mind around all of this because I'm still processing it, to be frank. I don't like to say to be honest because I think we should always be honest, but I go there. <laughs> Hear me, somebody. I'm just going to be honest with you. Well, oh, please. <laughs> but to be frank, I want to do my best to convey this. I want to preach a message that I'm entitling, Only What You Do For God Will Last. Only what you do for God will last. God bless you. You can be seated. <clears throat> I pray tonight that I can take my time a little bit. I know we've shouted and we've danced, but I still think God has something for us. <clears throat> I think he's got something for us tonight. Amen. I think he's got something for us this coming week. I think the best is yet to come. Amen. Amen. God's done great things in Durham, North Carolina, but you're right, Brother Godier, God is just getting started. God's just getting started. Praise God. I don't know how I got there. I, I just, my alarm went off early. I, it was dark. It's my favorite time to study. I opened up the laptop. I brewed the coffee, and I just dove headfirst into the book of Hebrews. Wasn't even a splash when I entered it. And I began to read about Joseph. And I'm going to say at the outset that you, you would be hard-pressed to find somebody more persecuted. Somebody who was done more wrong unto them than Joseph. There's this early period of his life that gives startling detail. And if you read it closely... The story of Joseph takes up the majority of the book of Genesis. The lion's share of Genesis is not Noah. It's not even Abraham. But it's Joseph. It's Israel. It's the workings of Israel as Israel becomes a nation and fits and starts. And the Bible is amazing in that it focuses on what God is interested in. You're not going to read a lot about Caesars. You're going to catch some passing references to Pharaohs. But, but most of what the actual scripture is about is not talking about Pharaoh was doing in the earth or what Caesar was doing in the earth, but it's looking at what God is doing in the earth. That's not how we work. Humans, we like to focus on us. What's Biden doing? What's Trump doing? What's Obama doing? What's Elon Musk doing? How about Jeff Bezos? The powerful, the wealthy, the rich, the influential, the politically connected. That's what we're wired for. But the Bible says not many mighty. Not many noble are called, but God has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. Our king was born in a manger. Our king was born in a town that was small among the nations, Bethlehem Ephratah. But out of that little town would come a ruler that would rule the nations with a rod of iron. Praise God. You probably see this really clearly when 
You see the story of the widow woman with two mites. She comes and she puts it into the offering. And heaven spent a lot of time talking about her. If heaven had a spotlight, it came on. It swiveled over to her. It focused in on her. And everything else went dark. And God highlighted what was important to him. And in that moment, two mites was more important than all the Caesars, all the Pharaohs, Cleopatra, Alexander the Great. All of that faded off into nothingness. As God said of her, this will be spoken of as a testimony for her. The rich man, just a casual reference. But she cast in all she had. That's the kind of stuff that would build nations. That's the kind of stuff God's kingdom is made of. And so tonight, I don't care how little the task you perform for Jesus Christ, if you give a cup of water in the name of Jesus, it matters. If you visit one prisoner in a prison in the name of Jesus, it matters. Hallelujah. What we do for God is what will last. That's hard to keep perspective of when you're doing it. It's not glamorous. Sunday school teachers a lot of times get overwhelmed by the grubby little fingers. Little snotty noses. The, the little will powers that are setting themselves against the teacher. And you got to keep their attention. And, and it can seem like it's not a whole lot. I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest things you could ever do. What you do for God matters more than anything else in this world. Praise God. We heard him, as Brother Godier was preaching this morning, I couldn't believe what he was saying because it was such a foundation for what God had laid on my heart already. I want to do more than what is asked of me. I want to get busy about my father's business. Winning souls, loving God. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now before I really launch into this that there are repercussions to what you do for God that you will never be able to fully calculate. You will set things in motion that you will never know, but your kids will find out. Your grandkids will find out. But the Godair, there are people all over this city that have been touched by Durham in the last 50 years. I go in, I go into Elmo's. And I sit down and they find out that I know Johnny Godair and man, the service just starts clicking. <laughs> Pays to have friends in high places. <laughs> but I meet servers who say, I rode the bus. I came to church. So-and-so taught me in Sunday school. This person touched my life. There's an army of people that have been touched by the ministries that have gone out of this lighthouse. Praise God. And it happened because people did something for God. There are people that have already passed away. We've done their funerals. And as they lay in this casket, one of the hopes that I had was that their works will outlast them. Their labors are not in vain. And I'm here to tell every person, every elder in this church, your labor is not in vain. Hallelujah. Your work is not in vain. Every bus route, every Sunday school class, everything you did for God, it matters. And it still resonates and vibrates and hums with anointing and power. My Bible tells me that there's prayers that are saved up in vials in heaven. Amen. Much mention is made of Sister Godair. And, and Bishop referenced it this morning. He said, I, I wish you could have known her in her 20s and her 30s and her 40s. But I believe there's still prayers and vials up in heaven. I believe there's still prayers up there from Sister Godair and from 
other great saints that have gone on before to see the Lord. And I think that every once in a while, God just unstops that stopper and just kind of pours out a little bit of that atmosphere. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm telling you, every prayer matters. Every service matters. Every altar call matters. Every family prayer night matters. Every dollar given matters. And it sends out ripples. It sends out, it sends out shock waves, not just across Durham, but across the cosmos. Only what I do for God will last. So you can only imagine what it felt like when strong hands grabbed Joseph, roughly handled him, maybe slapped him around to make him compliant, and then threw him into a hole in the ground. And he looked up, and the last faces he saw as he fell were the faces of his brethren. Cruel, angry. Because sometimes in the purpose of God, you can get mistreated by the people you love the most. You know, people forget that it's not just that there's a church, but, but the church is made up of people. And people have problems. People say it wrong. They do it wrong. And, and, when, and when you get involved with life, bad things can happen, even in a church. We're not here to tell any sad stories. We're here to glorify God. And I want you to remember what I'm saying right now. The bad things that people do, if you will put your eyes on Jesus, get your eyes off of what they said and put your eyes on Jesus, he'll make it right. I want everybody that's watching on the internet tonight that hasn't yet worked up the courage to come back to FPC, I want you to remember that Brother Urshan said this, God will make everything right. Amen. Everything you did, God will reward you for it. Every, every act that was given, God will reward you for it. Hallelujah. Your faith, your sincerity, your genuine desire for the purpose of God. Somebody might have said something ugly. Doesn't matter. God's still good. Somebody might have gossiped. Doesn't matter. God's still good. Somebody might have mistreated you. God's still good. God's still good. God's still good. And the kind of spirit that overcomes the world is that even as they're pounding the nails into his hands, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Pawns in the hands of the devil. But here's how the wisdom of God that even in Satan's treachery, God's working. Even in the middle of the gossip, God's working. Even in the hidden agendas and the humanity and the selfishness and the pettiness, God's still working. Hallelujah. Don't you ever lose sight of the fact that 10 years from now, that little trouble you're going through, nobody's going to remember it. What they said, where, how they did it, the look on that, nobody's going to remember any of that. What they will remember is what you do with it. There's something powerful that in spite of it all, somebody still lifts up their hands and says, hallelujah, anyhow. Ten years from now, they're not going to remember what they said. They're going to remember, did you make it? Did you walk through the valley? Did you cross the Jordan River? Did you keep on keeping on? Did you get back to the altar? Did you get back to the Holy Ghost? Did you get back? So they did something ugly. Go out and teach a Bible study. Go out and bring somebody to church. God will make it right. There's probably no better illustration of this than the Good Samaritan when people fell upon him and hurt him and stripped him of his raiment, took all of his belongings, beat him. The Bible says left him half dead. And, and, and the Samaritan comes. This is after the Levite has passed him by. This is after the, the rabbi has passed him by. But, but then the Samaritan, the last one you'd think, comes and picks him up. And he binds up his wounds and pours in oil and wine. Powerful metaphors for the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you just need another touch of the Holy Ghost. 
Sometimes when you're beaten up and bloody and somebody's mistreated you, just get to the church and let the oil and wine flow into your life. Let Jesus pick you up. They used a donkey. We use buses today, but it's the same thing. Just get them to the place of healing. Just get them to the place of strength. Get them to the place of restoration. Hallelujah. There's a, there's a God that will get to where you are and pick you up and bind your wounds up. And he'll look, fill you with the Holy Ghost and touch you. Man, I could feel it. Man, when they sang, God made it fail. God made it fail. Everything the devil tried. I could feel wounds closing. I could feel hurtful words flying out the window. It's hard to focus on that bad stuff when his glory shines so bright. I had an old preacher tell me one time. He said, Brother Urshan, did you know that when the sun is shining, the stars are still there? I said, really? They are? I thought they went on vacation or something. He said, no, they're still there. They're right where they were. You just can't see the night because the light's so bright. Mm. Somebody needs to write a song like that. If you'll let God shine down on you, all of that nighttime stuff won't matter anymore. You won't even see the trial. You won't even see the darkness. His light just outshines all of it. Amen. He's the bright and he's the morning star and the beauty of God, the power of God. I can't, I can't even remember who said what about me. I'm too excited about what's coming down the road. I'm too excited about the next Bible study. I'm too excited about who got baptized last week. The shining of the sun is so bright. The promise of the future is so good. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was thrown into a pit. They pulled him out and they sold him into slavery. I want to take my time here because I'm trying to set the stage for what I'm trying to say. He gets to Potiphar's house and he's elevated and then he's betrayed again, falsely accused. They throw him in prison. You talk about a setback. You ever had a setback? You thought you were getting somewhere? And all of a sudden, whoom, the devil just throws you backwards? It's not always the devil. Sometimes God is just moving a pawn on the chessboard of cosmic reality. God's in a game with the devil, and God's going to win. And if God moves you over to one side of the board and you don't like it, you keep praising anyway. You keep loving anyway. You keep glorifying God anyway. You keep trusting in God anyway. Because the battle's not mine. It's the Lord's. Hallelujah. And if he says, come, I come. And if he says, go, I go. All I know is when it's done, there's healing. There's power. There's virtue. I'm a man under authority. And the Bible said that's faith. That's great faith. Now, you can take that personal when he drops you into that prison house and you got to start all over again. Or you can say, have your way, Jesus. And he rises to the top of the prison. Eventually, you find out that God was just preparing him. Now, contrast that. Let me set Joseph on a shelf. I'm going to tell you about another figure during this time. I was talking to my sons and my nephew-in-law this afternoon at lunch, and I said, my head's swirling because of the goodness of God. You won't find a lot of attention being given to scriptural things when you study history. There's an archaeological world, an anthropologic world that they like to say Moses didn't exist. They like to say David and Goliath never happened. Problem is, the archaeology keeps proving them wrong. I remember one time I opened up one of the archaeological journals and I found out that they had just unearthed a stone inscription from an ancient Philistine village in ancient Ashkelon. And on the top of it was the name of the powerful chieftain, the warlord of that region. And his name was Goliath. 
We call him Goliath. I saw that. I, mm, mm. God's word is true. And the world might not appreciate that. The world might not recognize that. But God knows what happened. And all the while this is happening, at the same time, there was this other fella who was very celebrated. Can I have just a couple minutes to talk about him? I want to get this right. He was famous. He became famous. You might have heard of him. If you've ever looked at Egypt for any length of time, you'll read about names that jump out at you, names like Ramses, Tutankhamun, or King Tut. And there's dozens and hundreds of pharaohs. They say that those lineages went way back, and they look at that and they say, where's Moses? There's no Joseph. And none of that matters. I, I stood in the Museum of Ancient Egyptology, and I looked at the mummies, and I saw the embalming. You can see them right there in a, a temperature-controlled glass case, and it's, it's stunning to see. And, and they're little guys. I mean, they're pretty old. I mean, I grant you. But some of them are four and a half feet tall. Life hadn't been very good. <laughs> Things been tough. <laughs> I feel like that sometimes on Mondays. <laughs> but though they say, there's no, there's no room for the Bible. There's no room for this Hebrew mythology. And the world's oftentimes not very interested in what God's doing. God's always got a plan. And even when the spotlight's somewhere else, God's raising up people. God's doing things with people. And that's what will last. I looked at the pyramids. I stood by the Sphinx. And I, I just I was overwhelmed by the, the magnitude of it all. The man I began to read about this morning, his name was Imhotep. Imhotep. Some of you might, might ring a bell. Some of you might have even read quite a a lot about him. He's, he's very famous. Imhotep was the wise man of his day. There was nobody that stood at his stature. His stature was so great that he even eclipsed the Pharaoh that was over him. The Pharaoh that was in power during the time of Imhotep was Pharaoh Djoser. Lower Peninsula, Egypt. And people had him way, way, way back in time for a long time, and he was this famous figure, and people glorified him. You ever hear of the mummy? Years and years ago, Hollywood came out with these scary things to scare people, and there was Frankenstein and Dracula, and then there was this other cast off. They called him the mummy. He chased people down. The mummy, in mythology, was Imhotep. Imhotep believed in coming back to life. In a time when there were all these pantheon of gods, Imhotep somehow believed that people would come back to life. And not only would they come back to life, but he would meet the love of his life who had died before him, and he would raise her from the dead. And so the mummy was looking for his beloved. And the world just celebrated that. People were, were all up in arms about that. Every once in a while, Hollywood will throw another Imhotep movie out there. The mummy, mummy returns, mummy this, mummy that. And a host of dad jokes about, I want my mummy. which I personally enjoy. <laughs> they say of Imhotep that, that he was so wise, nobody could resist his wisdom. And, and they got sick of it. The, the astrologers and the wise men, they said of him, they said, if you're so smart, why don't you do the impossible? Why don't you make 
why don't you make an island in the desert? There's an old inscription on an old obelisk that records this in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Why don't you make an island in the desert? And Imhotep thought about it and said, give me a few days, let me pray, and I'll give you your island. He gathered the slaves, he gathered the workers, and they dug a canal on the edge of the Nile in a half moon and reconnected it about a mile north, and he made an island in the desert. And they had to give him treasure because Imhotep succeeded in it by just digging a big, long trench. He outsmarted, he outwitted all of his peers, and he rose to such power and such greatness. And all the while the world was celebrating him, you don't hear a whole lot about what God was interested in. God doesn't, doesn't talk about Imhotep. God was interested in Joseph. But yet his exploits continue. They say he's the father of modern medicine. His Egyptian name was something set, path, tut of some kind. I can't remember it now. But the path that was in the name is where the word pathology comes from. And, and Galen and Hippocrates all claim that Imhotep was the one that they studied to prepare for medicine, to bring modern medicine into the world. They say of him that he built the first pyramid, that he figured out that you could stack stone and you could build to such a degree and you could measure to such a degree and this new archaeological evidence points to the fact that he is one of the original architectural wonders that used math they called him a polymath he was excellent in every field and they said that the spirit of the gods lived inside of Imhotep later on he figured out that you didn't have to stack stones and drag them all over the place. He said there's these things called columns. Who knew? <laughs> columns. Columns. Yeah, see, back then they thought they had to stack everything. Then a wise man looked at it and said, wait a minute, you can stack it, put a space, stack it, put a space, and you can put a beam over the top of it, and it'll still hold the wall up. Ta-da! a third of the building material, and it'll last just as long. And when Alexander came in and saw the wonders of Egypt, and he saw those columns, he said, we can do that in Greece. And the Romans said, we can do it in Rome. And they created Corinthian columns, and Doric columns, and Ionic columns, and all of the columns that are there come from Imhotep and his architectural wonder. It wasn't until archaeologists dug deeper that they found what was called the famine stella. Stella is, a, is an archaeological inscription on granite that they would write in stone. They wrote it in stone because they knew men would change things. See, the more, the more things are passed down, the more they morph and the more they change. You ever play that game where one person gets one end of a line and whispers to another person and they'll say something like, the dog is hungry? And when it gets to the next one, it becomes something, and then the next one, the next one. You get pounded down about 25 people by the time it all gets done, and it, it turns into, let's go eat at McDonald's. <laughs> you play that game? <laughs> That's exactly what happens with myths and legends as it's passed down. They grow, and they shrink, and, and they take on dimensions that the originals never have. It wasn't until they went to this island that archaeologists looked at this famine stella, and they, they, they saw a picture of Imhotep come before, him, before Pharaoh Djoser, and he's talking to him, and he's counseling Pharaoh Djoser, and what he said was, there's seven years of famine coming. They took a closer look at Imhotep and they found out that the Chronicles say he was 110 years old when he died. They found out that he was part of the high priest of Heliopolis, which was ancient, the ancient city of On. 
The Bible says that Joseph married the high priest's daughter of Heliopolis. The young man looked at the old professor and said, Professor, is it possible that Joseph could have known Imhotep? And the professor looked at him and said, Son, no, that's not what that means. That means Joseph was Imhotep. Just because the world labels you one thing doesn't mean God doesn't know who you are. Now, this is not pseudoscience. This isn't false. I'm not trying to shock anybody. You can look this up. It is not almost 99% accuracy that the time now matches. They've, they've rearranged it. And they believe with almost complete certainty that Joseph of the Bible is the famous Imhotep that would save the Egyptians. I'm telling you, God knows what he's doing. I am telling you that what you do for God will last. I'm telling you God has a plan for your life no matter what your enemy says, no matter what society says, no matter what the current political situation says, no matter what denomination says, God knows how to put his spirit down on the inside of a man and the inside of a woman and he knows how to raise them up for the glory of God. Hallelujah. And I know it gets, it gets corrupted as it gets passed down, but Imhotep kept saying things like, there's life after death. There's life after death. They say that he started the embalming process. He began to do things medically because he always knew. He didn't know everything. He didn't know all the details. He was Old Testament, but he knew that there's a day coming when there's going to be life after death. Hallelujah. Now, as, as Revelation comes along, we see more light as time goes on. And j just because the world sees him in the secular sense doesn't mean God's not working in the middle of all of it. Praise God. The world knew him as Belteshazzar. They knew him as the guy that could interpret ancient languages. But that's not how God knew him. God knew him as Daniel, in whom was the spirit of the Most High God. God knew him as the one that would not corrupt himself with the Babylonian king's meat. And while they called him Belteshazzar, God said, you're not Belteshazzar, you're Daniel. You're my son. I've got you in the middle of all of that corruption. And you're going to be a light and you're going to be a testimony. God never said there wouldn't be lions. He just said, I can shut the mouths of the lions when they throw you in there. I don't care what the world calls you. I'm interested in what God calls you. The world might call you one thing, but if you're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, you've got an identity that can change everything. You've got a purpose that can change everything. You've got a calling that matters more than anything else in the world. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, why aren't you bowing down? Babylonian king called them by their Babylonian names. Whew, but it's not what Babylon says you are. It's what God says you are. Amen. They couldn't figure out why these Babylonian boys wouldn't bow down. It's because they weren't Babylonian boys. They were Hebrew boys. And their name's not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's Hananiah. It's Azariah. It's Mishael. We are the worshipers of the one true living God, and we're not like everybody else around here. We don't worship multiple gods. There's one God who made heaven and earth, and you can heat that furnace up seven times all you want to. I'll never bow. I'll never bow. I'll never bow. Hallelujah. And while everybody else bowed to the political pressure, three boys stood. Because it's what you do for God that lasts. It's what you do for God that matters. A lot of times it's not popular in the moment. Stand anyway. Now I can't go into Home Depot without thinking of Imhotep. <laughs> I 
If there never had been an Imhotep, we might still be hauling limestone from 20 miles away and stacking it up for our houses. But now when you walk in, there's four by fours, there's six by sixes. You can set them apart, 16 on center. 24 on center on the ceiling. Because somebody got a revelation that there's structure. I don't know. I don't know. You know, the Bible says he understood bones. They say of houses and architecture that houses have good bones. That's what modern housing is. It's bones, and you put the skin over it. Drywall and siding, but it's basically what is. I just don't know that maybe God put that spirit of wisdom down on the inside of that man, said there's a better way to do things. What are you saying, Brother Urshan? You're getting out there in left field. Well, I don't know. I just think that there's repercussions to everything we do for God. I think that while we're just living for God, God's doing things. He's impacting people. You don't know who's watching you. You don't know what your decisions mean. You don't know. Every time you make a decision for God, I think it lasts. I think every time you stand up when everybody else is sitting down, I think that, that it lasts. I think every time you, you decide, I'm going to church, I'm going to praise God, I'm going to live for God, I'm going to work for God, I think it lasts. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can't tell you everything. He said, we don't know much from when he was betrayed all the way to the end of his life, but he lived 60, 70 years during that time. All the while, he was doing good. They know he built the silos that held the grain. They know that he saved Egypt. And one archaeologist said, how an Imhotep came from out of nowhere, he was not Egyptian to rise to great power. They said, how many guys can come out of nowhere, rise to great power, save Egypt from famines, die at 110 years old, and be a priest in the house of Heliopolis? The world will label you one thing, but God will call you another thing. Amen. I walked up into that Sunday school room today. I saw some of those young men. I saw, I saw our young men teaching them and working on them. They had their hands full. Those guys were all over the place. And Holy Ghost filled young men had a hold of them. And, and that's tough. Not a lot of people like to do that. It's, it's stressful. It, sometimes fights break out. Sometimes things get chippy, but, but if, if there's not somebody willing to jump into Egypt and say, I'll make a difference, I'll pull somebody out of a pit, I'll pull somebody out of a chaos, hallelujah, there's things being done there. there, there are actions being taken that will forever impact people's lives. And I believe with all my heart, in the next five years, the next 10 years, there's going to be young men and young ladies rise up out of that that are full of the Holy Ghost because somebody came with healing in their hands. Somebody came with words that they had never heard before. Somebody came and said, there's a God in heaven and he loves you and you've got a purpose and you don't have to die in these circumstances. But I'm going to do something for God. I'm going to pick up somebody for church. I'm going to teach them a Bible study. I'm going to sit down and show them the purpose that heaven has for their life. Now, you can get all caught up in the local stuff. You can get caught up in he said, she said. You can get offended, or you can look at what God's doing. Sometimes, sometimes I think that all people can see is the building of the silos and the putting of the grain and the, and the magnificent chariots and the, the lifted shoulders and the, and the magnificent appearance of great people doing great things. I wonder if they could look back and see them in that pit. If you never endure the pit, you never get a ride in the chariot. You think that pit defines you? You think that's the end of the story? I got something for you tonight, and I've said it before. When you don't know what to do, you do what you know to do. What am I going to do, Brother Urshan? Sometimes I don't know the answer to that, Brother Galindo. But what I do know is we're going to pray. We're going to open up the Word of God. We're going to seek comfort from the Scriptures. I don't know the answer, but we're just going to do what, what Israel told us to do. We're going to do what Abraham told us to do. We're going to... 
but they did this. That's not right. They're hypocrites. They should, doesn't matter. I'm just going to do what I know I'm supposed to do. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I'm just going to keep on. I'm just going to keep believing. I'm going to keep on trusting in God. Listen, if you'll humble yourself under the hand of God, he will exalt you. He will exalt you. I bet, I bet they never realized when they threw him in, into the prison house and he lay there in that prison and he looked around and thought, how did I get here? There'll be some times you don't know how you got to where you are. God is putting inside of you the stuff that will keep you when he gets you to where he wants you. Let me take it from another approach. Don't try to elevate yourself up into the throne room if you don't know how to survive in the pit. A lot of people make it to the throne room and they never developed the discipline. They never developed the courage. They never developed the determination. They never developed the prayer life. They never learned how to call on the name of God. But there's things you'll learn in the pit that nothing else will ever teach you. In the name of Jesus, you are my provider. When nobody's watching, I'm dancing anyway. When nobody cares, I'm praising anyway. When nobody's wondering what's going on, I'm giving him glory anyway. If I can be faithful in a few things, God knows how to make me ruler over many. This all right? I got to Roatan, and I got to Roatan in very, very discouraging circumstances. We, had, our church, probably had about three hundred and fifty people on Sunday mornings, and and God had arranged it to where I was gonna resign the church and give it to my friend and move on and it was tough. Bishop Godier was a great support to me during that time. Bishop Holmes was a great support. Bishop Wilson, great support to me. Sometimes you don't know why God does what he does. I remember preaching in a 10 by 10 room and it had one naked light bulb in the middle of it. You know, didn't even have a shade on it. He just clicked it and boom, came on and, and the room was six foot four. I know that because I'm six foot three. And I preached like this. Then Peter said unto them, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. I remember one day the humanity just got to me. I just sat in the corner. I thought, God, what in the world am I doing? This room's 10 by 10 and six foot four. And there's that stupid light bulb. There were four elderly ladies that came to hear me because I think they felt sorry for me. And there, the, there were whole, it was a wooden floor and there were holes and gaps. The construction wasn't very good on this little room. Someone had just put it together with some spare scrap wood. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm a little feel, feeling kind of sorry for myself, wondering what God's going to do with my life. And I looked down and... I could see through the crack, and there was a guy looking at me <laughs> from the floor underneath me, and there was just an eyeball looking at me. <laughs> and I remember thinking, here's this 10 by 10 room, it's six foot four, there's that light bulb, and there's an eyeball looking at me. <laughs> it don't get much worse than that right there. <laughs> when you don't know exactly what God's doing even when you don't feel him he's working even when you don't see him he's working he never stops he never stops working he never stops he never stops working I remember going from that little group to where people were standing around the door. People were sitting in the window. There were 25, 30 people crowding into that little room, and we were still preaching. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
I'll never forget. I'll never forget it. We would drive by five false doctrine churches filled with people preaching and preaching in Spanish. And here I am with my English. I am terrible at Spanish. My interpreter was worse at English. And we're preaching Acts 2.38. Amen. I'm just telling you, you just keep on keeping on. You keep on believing God. There's a universal language. There's a Jesus name message that if you can ever let it get started, God will do it in a prison. God will do it in a pit. God will do it wherever you are. God will just look for somebody to do his will. We got to the point where, where we ran out of room, so we rented a room. And it was higher up the hill, and it sat 60 people. I'll never forget being thankful for concrete walls. And I'll never forget the first couple services. People came in, and that group of 25 swelled to 30 and 40. And we started having church at the top of that colonia, praising God and worshiping God. Somewhere in there, a man showed up, and he said, Brother Urshan, my name is Pastor Gutierrez. I am here. God sent me here to help you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Brother Glendo, you met Brother Gutierrez. His Spanish is good. God knew what I needed, and I needed an hermano to help me preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, how'd you get here? He said, they deported me. They deported me. The United States deported me. He said, I, when I first went to the United States, you got time for this? I'm just talking about what it's like to live in a pit and what it's like to live in a jail and what it's like to live in lowly circumstances, but God's got a plan. And everything you do for Jesus, everything you do for God, hallelujah. He said, I, when I first went to the United States, I was from Honduras. He said, I got in a fight at a bar and I stabbed a man. He said he didn't die. He lived. They gave me two years in prison. I was 23, 24 years old. He said, I'm almost 70 now. He said, I, I went to prison for two years. I got out in my mid-20s and, and I got a job. I got a job at a local fabrication plant. I paid my debt to society. He said, I became a Jehovah's Witness. And he said, I love God, and I thought I knew God. He said, and I worked at that fabrication plant for 40 years. They, they manufactured the heavy steel cylinders that go on asphalt paving machines. That big cylinder that rolls it flat and makes it flat. He fabricated those in Houston, Texas for over 40 years into his late 60s. And, and there, uh, when he was about six months away from retirement, six months away from retirement, they, he had a full pension, he had full Social Security, and the Obama administration was allowing the INS to find anybody they could to lower their numbers. And they, they came knocking on his door and said, we see you have a felony from 45 years ago. We're deporting you tomorrow. He said, I lost my pension, I lost my social security, and I found myself back in Honduras where I hadn't been in almost five decades. He said, I thought my life was over. I said, well, how did you get here? He said, well, about four years before I, I, all that happened, he said, a man knocked on my door and said, have you ever heard of Pastor James Kilgore in Houston, Texas? He said, there's a church over here that you need to come to, and God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He said, I was a Jehovah's Witness. I didn't know what it was. He said, but the first time I went, I felt the Holy Ghost move over my life. He said, I know that God's real. Can you teach me? I taught him Bible study. We, we helped him grow in his doctrinal knowledge. I wish I could take you down there today. I wish I could show you him preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ up in front of over 200 people in a brand new building on the edge of the ocean. I, I wish I could show you what God has done. One day, Brother Newton, I, I, I went up to him with tears in my eyes. I said, Brother Gutierrez, do you realize what this means? He said, I, I don't know. I, it's great. And I pulled out a picture of James Kilgore and N.A. Urshan at a general conference. Their arms were around each other, and they were weeping tears and praying in the altar and the Holy Ghost. That picture was from the 1980s. 
They were both strong. They were both full of health and vitality. And they were in their life doing their ministry, working for God, not knowing that they were both setting in motion young men that would go out into the rest of the world. You have no idea what happens when you start doing things for God. You have no idea the ships that you're launching and the things that you're putting in motion. One would go to Florida. One would go to Honduras. We'd meet on the other side. I'm telling you that what you do for God is the only thing that matters. There's a residual effect that piles up and piles up and God's got a plan and God's got a purpose and God's got a man and God's got a woman and that's what makes his kingdom move forward. Let's stand in this house tonight. I want somebody to lift your hands to heaven. Hallelujah. 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 When it got through all the, all the unclean filters of secular society, musicians can come. When it got through all those unclean filters, they got mummies and they got reincarnation. They got all this garbage. I don't think that's what he was looking for at all. He gave commandment concerning his bones at his death. Don't leave my bones in Egypt. Hallelujah. Speaking of things concerning his death, uh, they, they, the, the archaeologists said we've never found the tomb of Imhotep. We found King Tut's tomb. We found Pharaoh Djoser's tomb. We found all these other tombs, but we can't find Imhotep's tomb. I know why. He gave commandment concerning his bones. Moses, don't leave me here. He told his grandsons, when the day comes, we're coming out of here. We're going to leave this place. We're not going to stay down here. There's a resurrection coming. And I'm giving you commandment concerning my bones. Don't you leave me here. I'm not staying here. I'm coming out of here. There was a revelation. And there's an empty tomb over there. I think he saw another day where there'd be another son of Abraham who was saying, I'm going to come out of here. And we're not staying here. And we're going to leave here. And I'm setting things in motion. I'm setting things in motion that one day... I'm leaving this whole world. Woo! Hallelujah! Praise God. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm preaching about the resurrection. I'm preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're preaching all over Durham. And it's what we do for God that lasts. Brother Layton is up in that media booth right now. He's putting words up on screens. He's making camera angles. He's doing something for God. He's teaching Bible studies. He's picking people up for church. Other young men, both TDV, FPC, you're doing it right now. You're doing things for God. This morning, Brother Layton had a devil costume on with boxing gloves on. And I put on boxing gloves going to knock the devil out and we're planting seeds in little hearts that Jesus wins Jesus wins that doesn't seem like a whole lot but Urshan everything you do for God everything you do for God a cup of cold water a Bible study an altar call I want somebody I want Sunday school teachers I want bus drivers I want people here I want you to come and join us down here at this front we're going to set some things in motion here today. Hallelujah. Right where you're at, I want you to come. I want you to come and lift your hands to heaven. Come on, TDB. I want you to come down here. Hallelujah. We're doing things for God. Hallelujah. We're picking people up for church. We're praying with people in the altars. Hallelujah. It's what you do for God that matters. On Friday night, there's a youth service. We're going to take out fusion. Amen. We're going to go do this activity. We're going to go do that activity. It's what you do for Christ. We're going to have lone soldier. We're going to have teaching. We're going to have training. We're going to preach the gospel. And what we're telling you is my bones are coming out of here. I'm not staying in this, in this whole world. 
I'm doing something for God. I'm doing something for the kingdom. Somebody lift your hands to heaven. Those pyramids, they're tourist attractions today. But there's men all over the world that are lift their hands to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Those Egyptian relics, they're in museums and they can't heal anybody. But there's a gospel that'll save and that will deliver to the uttermost. And it lasts and it endures and it's a kingdom that will never be moved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not mummifying bodies. I'm not embalming anybody. I'm preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That one day a trumpet's going to sound. I'm going to be changed. And this mortal is going to put on immortality. Joseph said, my bones aren't staying here. I'm going to do something for God. I'm going to make a difference. God gave me an identity. God gave me a calling. The world may not know what it is, but heaven knows what it is. Oh, that's it. Lift your voice and lift your hands today.